Okay, Dr. Morris, once again, uh, we are back for another conversation with the docs, and you have a very, very special guest for us today. Yeah, absolutely, Tony. Uh, Tony, I want to introduce you to my guest, Dr. Falkier. Dr. Falkier is an ex expert in internal medicine, and she's also adopted a, uh, a recent uh, interest in what's called culinary medicine. And I'll let her explain to you exactly what that is all about. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morris and Tony, for having me here with you and part of this conversation. So yes, I did internal medicine primary care for 15 years. And in 2016, I started uh, practicing culinary medicine and now do that fully. And really what that is, is evidence-based nutritional information. So the why, why should I eat this versus that? And then the how, to, uh, really going into teaching kitchens and getting that discomfort of how do I cook for myself? How to incorporate more foods that are not processed? And there's incredible data looking at chronic lung disease, both prevention and uh, management. So I'm really excited to dive in with you. So again, thank you for the invitation. Certainly looking forward to this conversation, Dr. Falke. I, I for one, cook a little bit, but am so interested in, in how I can eat a little bit better. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Morris, and I am the chair of the American Lung Association Mission Committee, which is a group of volunteers uh, with expertise in various different aspects of clinical and environmental uh, medicine and nursing and respiratory care. Uh, we have banded together to help the Lung Association accomplish its mission. And part of that mission is uh, our program for tonight. And uh, we uh, have a weekly series here made possible by a generous grant from the Burr Heart and Lung uh, Clinic at Sharp Grossman Hospital and the San Diego uh, Foundation. We'll be meeting every Wednesday for uh, several Wednesdays. We've already had a few meetings on asthma management and the environmental effects of lung health. And today we're very lucky to have Dr. Uh, Sabrina Falkier, who you just uh, saw meet uh, Tony Gwynn. And Dr. Falkier, as uh, you had heard, is a expert in internal medicine. And then in this phase for, of her career um, has decided to focus on uh, a little bit more towards uh, natural prevention of, uh, of lung disease and maybe even some natural prevention of problems in people that have lung disease <clears throat> through uh, culinary medicine. So we're very thrilled to have her back. Uh, we, she spoke to us once before and this is an encore performance. So Dr. Falkier, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. I am again, really excited to be here. I'm gonna share my slides. And uh, my goal is really to make this really fun, interactive. Um, we're gonna, my goal is to speak for about 25 minutes, 30 at the most, and then really to have a conversation about this. So I'm gonna share my screen here. One second. This is always a tricky part. Give me one second here. You guys see most of the slide. I know you probably have a big black line. We're seeing it fine. Okay, perfect. All right. So again, my area of specialty is culinary medicine, and I will start by defining it again. So culinary medicine is evidence-based nutritional information meets the culinary arts and really focusing on food rather than thinking about supplements or otherwise um, as the root of how to prevent disease and how to manage disease and treat disease. So who am I? So I uh, was born and raised in Mexico City to Swiss and American parents. And the reason I say this is because my multicultural and multilingual background has really shaped my work. Um, there's a, a giant piece in culinary medicine of helping people learn or retain their cultural roots as far as food. So there's often the sense that I either am eating healthy in a box or I'm eating the foods I like or the flavors I like. And really to help people find healthy within the, the palate that they have, between the, be, behind the memories that they have of a, a grandparent in the kitchen or a parent in the kitchen. And a lot of it, when we go back to any culture, any part of the world, we all ate from the land. We all ate predominantly fruits and vegetables, grains, et cetera, and to return to that. So as uh, Dr. Moore said, I did, I practice internal medicine in a multi-specialty group here in San Diego for over 15 years. In 2016, I discovered culinary medicine actually at a conference up in Napa. 
And uh, I started crying when the keynote speaker started talking and crying at medical conferences is not usual. And I could feel that there was this giant swerve that was gonna happen in my life. I didn't know what it would look like. But fast forward, I actually started my company, Sensation Salud, that is really about waking up all your senses around food, where we get it, how we prepare it, who we're around when we eat it. And then Salud has a double meaning. Now that you know, Spanish is my first language. It's health, but it also means cheer. So really celebrating life. And I was board certified through a two-year uh, certification process and got certified, found out I passed the day before I, I finished my last patient care day in May last year. And most important, last but definitely not least, is I love delicious food. So that is up most important, is to really have food that really tastes delicious and that really promotes health. So really, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the, the cultural culinary history. Um, don't fall asleep on me here, but really just give an idea of how we kind of got in the mess that we are in as far as uh, the food that was we were told to eat and the consequences that that has had in our society. And then look at the science a little bit. And the goal is not to go nitty gritty deep into it, but to realize there is uh, evidence based information for culinary medicine. And then we switch gears and really look at what are ways to start moving that needle really even with our dinner tonight or our meals um, or, or even what we're drinking? And then again, that question and discussion. So to give you an idea, kind of going back uh, when before we started looking at data, we really thought that we were, you know, what our genes told us. So if we died of a heart attack at 30, okay, that's just the way it was meant to be. And it wasn't until the Framingham study, which there's been multiple renditions that we really started seeing that there were modifiable risk factors that led to outcomes. And essentially the first, um, the first phase of, or the first generation of the Framingham study came out in 1948. And right around this time, a few years later, President Eisenhower actually had a heart attack while he was in office. So there was this greater awareness of the of there are more heart attacks happening. Someone in in the light of being in the presidency has a heart attack, and now realizing there's actually things that were modifiable. So what is this culinary history I'm talking about? So essentially there's an increase in consumption of animal proteins that started in the 1930s, essentially when we had access to refrigeration. And then the Framingham study came out about two decades later. We're noticing people are eating more red meat. Uh, we are starting to see more heart attacks. So there's this kind of these two pieces brought together uh, to Congress of, of with the ultimate outcome was the first dietary guidelines for Americans, which came out in 1980. And it's still to this day updated every five years. And really what this process does is it, look, it looks at all the science. And then politics comes in there. And so there's this kind of funnel between what the science is showing from nutritional information and what the politicians uh, come in there. So big industry such as meat industry, dairy industry play a big role in this. So the initial wording for this 1980 was to be that people should eat less red meat. But guess what? The, the um, meat industry did not like that. So it got translated to people should eat less saturated fat. Most people don't know what that is. So essentially from there, we started the fat-free craze. So we got all the fat-free aisles, all the foods that were fat-free. And we thought, well, if there's no fat, we can just eat it to abandon. But to make a pastry taste good without any fat, we need to, it tastes like cardboard unless you add a lot of sugar. And that's what happened. So we had uh, processed food aisles, skyrocketing of salt, sugar, and processed grains. And also this fast food nation came around the same time, kind of in the 80s. There was a big transition in our society of going from kind of the more traditional one, one uh, household member staying home and doing um, the cooking and food prep. And another one is going out into the working world. And now there was a big conversion to having a lot more either two, two people in the household going out to work or having single parent households. So the next few slides are kind of the bad news and then we'll get into the empowerment part. So the red, when we look at foods, what are things people often ask me? What is something I should never eat or what is something that I should eat all the time? The bottom line is there's no, there's no kind of halo health, health halo food that if you eat this, you're going to live until 150 and there's no, the opposite. There's, there's no food that's off the table, but really knowing how frequently to have it in our, in our day-to-day -day eating. Yet, if somebody asks me truly, what are kind of the three, the three big ones to try to move away from number one are processed grains. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a bit. Number two is sugar. 
uh, which is also a very processed uh, form of sugar cane and processed meat. So what is a uh, processed grain? So essentially what you're seeing there is a whole wheat or whole grain kernel, which has three parts. So we have the bran on the outside, which has the fiber. It has a lot of vitamins and minerals. We have the middle part, or sorry, the lower part, which is the germ. That is essentially where you have the healthy oils, the fat soluble vitamins, and then you have the starchy endosperm. The endosperm is what white flour comes from. It is what is used uh, left, right, and center on most of our foods that we eat. And the, it was great initially because this was during the world war. So the, if you take away, especially the germ, you have an endless shelf life. So now you can get bread and products to the troops. They could be um, you know, transported long distances. We didn't have to worry about refrigeration. Problem was though, is we lost all nutrition whatsoever. So as a country, when we started realizing this, we started seeing deficiencies like beriberi, which we hadn't seen in hundreds of years. So really basic vitamin deficiencies. So as a country, instead of going back to whole grains, we started fortifying. So this is where you see the fortified cereals, like the really sugary cereals, but it says fortified with your essential vitamins. And essentially the problem with processed foods is they're low in fiber, they're low in micronutrients and phytochemicals, they're high in fat, sugar, and sodium. And there was actually a study that came out about two or three years ago. Again, time flies. I feel like the study just came out. We're really looking at ultra processed versus unprocessed foods um, and seeing this was actually one of the few randomized controlled um, studies that they had food related. And the reason that's so tricky is because it's hard to control what people eat and it's really hard to have centers where you have full control of what people are ingesting. And it really it showed that people who were eating the ultra processed food were actually eating a lot more calories to feel full compared to the unprocessed. And part of that is because you're not getting the nutrients, your body's gonna continue wanting to take in more of these foods. And added sugar is linked to increased body weight, high blood pressure and poor lipid profile. So that's another one of those red light items I talked about. And then meat consumption, which comes in a lot when we talk about um, COPD, which I'll go into in a little bit. But the, this study was interesting. So essentially what it, to summarize, it showed that eating more than one serving of red meat per day uh, increased all cause mortality. So any reason of dying. And when we think about our typical American diet, our um, standard American diet, the acronym of SAD diet, is most people have meat at least three times a day. So you'll have, you know, bacon for breakfast, a burger for lunch and tacos for dinner or pizza with pepperoni or otherwise. So this was, I mean, the, the sharp increase from just having one, one portion of red meat and especially if it was processed, the worst being uh, things like hot dogs, bacon, um, and also the people who tended to have more of the meat consumption also tended to have less fruits and vegetables and also a lower um, number of years of education. Now going into COPD risk and cured meat. So essentially uh, there were two studies that showed that essentially patients who consume cured meats at least 14 times per month. So essentially, again, this is, this is looking at less than one per day. So it's like one portion every other day had an 80% greater risk for COPD than those who avoided meat. And the second one is from the health professional study found that men who ate cured meat daily had two and a half times the risk of COPD compared with people who rarely consumed it. And the cured meats are things like salami, um, again, dried meats, um, those, that category. And as a country, we tend to have two to three times the recommended daily protein amount. So the sense of if I wanna get more muscle, I need to eat more muscle um, is really a misnomer. What we need to build muscle are actually the amino acids. So our body, even if we eat a lot of uh, animal flesh, we are essentially breaking it down and it's like Lego. So you, if you eat the Lego castle, your body's gonna break it down into all the individual pieces and build its own muscle. So all vegetables and fruits have amino acids in them. So really thinking about getting that variety because then I'm gonna get different amino acids and then my body is going to make uh, what I need. So that's the end of the bad news ones. So just a little pause there. So the high carb diet I put you on 20 years ago gave you diabetes, high blood pressure and heart disease. Oops. So yeah, we kind of got ourselves in a big mess. So what did we start looking at that could make a difference? So the Mediterranean pattern of eating is really the one that has the most evidence-based information for long-term 
engagement. And what I mean by that is most people can um, sustain being on a diet as restrictive as it may be for about three months. And after that, um, people really have a hard time sticking with it. So the Mediterranean diet, the three studies I show here are three of the kind of paramount that have that really kind of shaped it. And so essentially the first upper left one was uh, looking at primary prevention. So they looked at people that had uh, risk factors um, su such as high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and they were either given, you know, the, the handout or even said, hey, you need to eat better by their healthcare provider, or they were given a liter of olive oil a week or a bag of nuts. And the group with the olive oil and the nuts actually had a much reduced, uh, statistically significant reduction in first events. The second study on the right is the Leo heart trial. This one I love because there's kind of actionable item right away. So these are people that had a heart attack before they left the hospital. They had a two hour pre-discharge discussion about um, Mediterranean pattern of eating. And they had a significant reduction in secondary events compared to the one that did not have that two hour conversation. And then the last one I'm going to show you, uh, this is Dr. Tricopolo out of uh, Greece, and she's the one that came with this nine point Mediterranean uh, scale, which I'll, which I'll show you guys. So I'm going to talk about, so the Mediterranean score is made out of nine points. And, and I don't want you to memorize this, but just thinking about this idea that if I add these items on the left, so we have vegetables, fruits and nuts, legumes, which are anything that grows in a pod. So think anything from lentils or beans, those fit edamame, any, those fit that criteria. Cereals, specifically whole grains, fish is recommended at least twice a week. Meat and meat products, less is better on this one and the least processed, the better. So if I'm gonna have red meat, I'm gonna make sure I get grass finished or 100% grass fed because that means they ate grass their whole life. And there's a very different lipid profile or cholesterol. So that marbling that you get in kind of typical um, steakhouses actually is very inflammatory for the body uh, because they were corn fed. So we really are eating whatever animal we're eating compared to if somebody, if an animal ate grass, there's a lot more omega-3 or anti-inflammatory pattern. Uh, dairy products, less is better again, and fermented is better. So this is where your yogurt that has the microbiome promoting qualities uh, is really helpful. Alcohol in moderation. So again, if someone has uh, problems with alcohol intake, the recommendation is none. Uh, but if someone does not, the recommendation is one glass of wine for women and up to two glasses of wine for men to be had with, with a meal on a day-to-day -day basis. So not to save, you know, your, if I'm a woman, I am a woman, um, to save the seven glasses till the weekend. Um, so it's really meant to be consumed with meals and then olive oil usage. Um, and again, a two point improvement. So say you never have fish or you've never touched a bean in your life. And all of a sudden you say, hey, you know, I can do this. I can do a meatless Monday and have some bean tacos or I can add some fish that reduces um, mortality by 25%. So pretty good bang for your buck there. And then the DASH diet, which is one that's often used more in the US than in, uh, in other parts of the world is a very similar to the Mediterranean uh, pattern that I just showed. It's catering a little bit more to the American palate. So there's a bit more sweeteners in there. There's a bit less um, emphasis on fish. Uh, but there's, again, a lot of the similar, similar uh, patterns. And when I say Mediterranean, it doesn't mean it's from only from the Mediterranean parts of Europe. There's actually something called the blue zones, which there are uh, about five or six blue zones throughout the world. So one's in Okinawa, Japan, uh, one's in Costa Rica, one is actually um, here in California. Um, there's a couple others. I can't think of where they are right now, but it's really that pattern of of um, really focusing on those nine points that I talked about. Oh, there we go. Okay. And the reason I specifically bring up the DASH diet, because I like to focus on the Mediterranean, but there's a lot of studies that show um, really the link with, with DASH because, um, because of the palate and how it's looked at here in the US. So these are two studies, um, just to give you an idea of how it's not just for diabetes or obesity or heart disease, but showing that culinary medicine has a role in multiple specialties. So the first, the upper right study is really looking at uh, COPD disease prevention and treatment and looking at multiple studies um, 
anywhere from observational to there's a couple of randomized control, but really looking at if one eats more from that Mediterranean pattern, more whole grains, more fruits and vegetables, the number of um, COPD exacerbations goes down. There's less mucus production because a lot of the mucus production tends to come from inflammation. So you have reduction in, um, in or I should say there's the increase in antioxidant markers in people and also reduction in inflammatory markers. And then the lower left is looking at asthma. So essentially looking at people who followed this dash pattern that I showed you and asthma um, exacerbations and them going down with the higher um, adherence to the dash pattern of eating. And before I go into now the how, like the more, more um, kind of colorful part of the talk, I always wanna bring up the importance of making sure we know when we give recommendations to our patients or for ourselves to make sure that we let our, our healthcare team know about food insecurity. So really this goal of there's these two questions that are implemented um, to help assess whether people have the ability to get the food that we're recommending. And the great thing is as a healthcare provider, the, the goal is if you find out somebody does have food insecurities or if you are food insecure yourself, please make sure to call 211 and they have an incredible amount of resources to help you. So now, uh, Michael Pollan, he is out of uh, Berkeley. He's written a ton of books and done some incredible movies as well. And he has this line, if I could stop after this, if we could all just heed this advice of eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. And I gotta tell you, most of the pictures in here are actually pictures I took at farmer's market. So I love this one of these carrots. <laughs> and before I go into it, I gotta tell you, so I've had the incredible opportunity to work with um, chronic lung disease um, patients and really showing empowerment through food. So I was invited to do the Lung Force Expo about three years ago. And from there, uh, some of the incredible women invited me to go to their Better Breathers Club. And the amount of enthusiasm in this group was incredible. And I say this because often there's a sense of at what point of life or what decade of life can we really um, empower change through food? And I was incredibly impressed um, every time I speak to different groups, different ages. Um, I almost feel like the two ends are my favorite. So I do a lot of teen culinary literacy to really empower athletes um, all the way to, to people in their and octarians or otherwise. And it really is amazing how when people have the knowledge, um, how much change they can, they can make. So when we eat, of course, we eat from a plate. So I was happy to see that we transitioned from the food pyramid to the healthy eating plate. And as I mentioned, that there's a lot with these uh, recommendations, dietary eating recommendations that come out every five years and politics getting involved in there. Harvard created this healthy eating plate, which is essentially the science before politicians got involved. And we're going to make our way around this plate. So in a general, you can see the left side, we have vegetables and fruits making up half the plate, whole grains being the upper right, and the healthy protein being the lower right. And then on the side, instead of a cup of milk, we have water. So hydration being the important thing. And then on the upper left, looking at healthy oil. So now realizing we're finally getting out of the fat free phase and learning the different qualities of oils and fats that we get and that they really make a difference. And then the lower left, remembering to stay active. So starting with what we drink, really rethinking our drink and really being careful with sugar sweetened beverages. Not only is it really processed what is in those beverages, but there's also a lot of um, caloric intake that we have in culinary medicine. I'm happy to say we don't talk about calories very much. I like the idea of visually thinking about that plate, but what's the problem when we have sugar sweetened beverages, whether it's soda or juice, is that we often don't um, think about it as part of our meal. So that's, um, that, that's a big problem because uh, there's been a lot of studies looked at how much more caloric ingestion or energy ingestion people will have in a day um, because they're having sweetened beverages. Uh, I'm sorry, my bird is being really loud so I'm asking my children to move them. <laughs> Uh, all right. Now, the cool thing is just like cigarettes. And what I love about speaking uh, with ALA here is that a lot of the movements we're making in culinary medicine are very similar to movements that were being made with smoking cessation campaigns. So we now have several cities that actually tax um, sugar sweetened beverages. There are a few in California and it's um, Berkeley was actually one of the first ones. So that's that's starting to have some impact. 
And the other part too, is not to have the health halo about sugar substitutes. So uh, for example, if somebody's in the afternoon slump and they're choosing to have a diet soda, for example, the tricky part about sugar substitutes is when our body gets something sweet in us and sugar substitutes tend to be sweeter than natural sugars is our body assumes that there's going to be calories that follow. So when it doesn't, there's this very confusing gut brain interaction that takes place and it actually makes us hungrier. So we tend to eat more. So that's number one. The other two big second problem that I'll talk about today with sugar substitutes is that it really affects the microbiome in our intestines. And the microbiome is the healthy bacteria in our gut. And I love, I feel like we're on the tip of the iceberg of the amount of information that we're slowly learning about the microbiome. We need to have a really healthy microbiome to absorb those nutrients that we want our body to absorb and also to create this healthy barrier. So we do not absorb the things we do not want to absorb. And we know that people who have a unhealthy microbiome, so very thinned out um, kind of gut lining. Uh, there's a increased um, infections in general, and there's uh, increased autoimmune illnesses that we've seen among many other things. So when we think about what happens, so the red line, if I have a really, uh, you know, sugary cereal with juice in the morning. I'm going to have the spike in my sugar and then it's going to plummet. And now I'm looking for the donuts or I'm looking at kind of any snack or food that I can get my eye on. And that loops throughout the whole day. This affects adults without being, not being able to deeply concentrate, like reading a research article or um, being patient with our children or family members or colleagues versus if we have a more um, even meal, and we'll go into kind of more what that would look like for breakfast, where we're able to be more patient, deep dive into conversations um, and difficult situations. And it's the same for kids. Um, they looked at a lot of studies where kids can't pay attention in the classroom and the circle time because they've, they're going in with a total sugar high and it just continues throughout the day. So moving on to breakfast. So the goal is finding any time where we can incorporate more vegetables and fruits into our breakfast as well as whole grains. So here's some simple examples. One is if we cut up the fruit, people tend to eat it more. Um, I don't know how many times if I, you know, the fruit, fruit is out in front, everybody will eat it. Otherwise the strawberries will rot in the fridge. Um, so you see the left one, it's really simply um, cut up bananas and strawberries. The middle one is essentially roasted vegetables that were roasted from the day before for dinner. Second use the next morning is warm them up and put a, a fried egg on top. And then on the right is overnight oats uh, with berries. So essentially the overnight oats give me my whole grain. I'm using um, plain yogurt, which is giving me um, a boost with my microbiome with the, the probiotics in that. And then I'm getting all those of uh, the fiber and all those vitamins and minerals from that, the varied fruits. And then for vegetables, variety is definitely key. So on the left here, you see a huge amount of roasted vegetables. On the right was uh, when my children were younger, one of them decided to make art with edible, you know, food that we could eat um, raw. And there's just something about being in the kitchen. It doesn't matter the age. If we had something to do with cooking dinner, we're more, to like, more likely to eat it and feel kind of a... Um, not a responsibility, but feel ownership of the food that's on our table and notice the nuances, like what spice gave what flavor, et cetera. And then whole grains. There are over three dozen whole grains, over a dozen of those are gluten-free. So really encouraging, um, just like to say, there's often a health halo. There's often a lot of people that feel like I just, I can't have any grains at all. And there's a lot of nutrients that are in whole grains that we're missing out if we're leaving out that entire, um, quadrant from our plate. And if somebody eats white rice, encouraging them at least to go to brown rice or red rice, each darker as far as the rice, um, the more nutritious it is. And also exploring all the naturally gluten-free options like rice or quinoa, amaranth, teff. I mean, there's a gazillion of them. And so that sense if someone's gluten intolerant, um, there are so many options available. So even a snack like having popcorn, that is a fantastic whole grain. The process that happens in the microwave of having those kernels open up, that the white stuff is that starchy endosperm. Yet when you're eating it, you're also ingesting the, uh, the husk and the germ as well. And then when we think about our protein, like I said, as Americans, we, we tend to have two to three times more than our body needs. So thinking in culinary medicine, we use this term called the protein flip. So really think about protein as a condiment rather than that giant steak in the middle of our plate. Proteins from plants are the best sources and unprocessed animals are, um, animal sources are 
to be to be a part of the meal i um i know there's there's a lot of movement to be 100 percent plant-based eating and like i said as far as the patterns of eating of what's sustainable long term the goal is always if we look at different kind of um I was gonna say trendy diets, but you know, you go to the, you, you pick up, you know, you go to the bookstore otherwise, and every month I feel like there's at least a dozen new, um, you know, quick fixes to our food patterns. And if we really look at the overall pattern of healthy and sustainable eating, it's really adding more from the plant kingdom. So keeping that in mind. And if I have a patient that I'm working with and they're used to their steak and potatoes, okay, so what if we do a stir fry or what if we do tacos and, and we do a veggie um, option and cube up that steak that maybe would have fed one person, now it feeds a family of four. So that reduces the cost um, because often people will say, well, eating healthy is expensive. So is, so is meat, right? So if we you now are eating, buying less meat and prioritizing towards eating more fruits and vegetables. That is a great change. Again, goal of a quarter of our plate um, at the most of the protein. Thinking about beans and lentils is an option. So either through soups or um, again, here in San Diego, we have so many options for amazing Mexican food. Uh, for, for people who love certain cuisine, so curry or stir fry is a fantastic way to still get um, again, if someone's a meat lover, so you're cubing it up. So you're still getting that, the, the mouth feel, uh, maybe the fatty uh, feel that we get from the steak, but now you're adding a lot more from the plant kingdom. Here's some options. Um, actually uh, on the left, we have some roasted um, Brussels sprouts with a little shaved cheese on top. That The cheese adds a lot of umami, which is essentially another um, flavor. So we think of sweet, sour, um, bitter, and umami is kind of a depth of flavor or like a savoriness. Um, roasted uh, yellow beans uh, with some mozzarella on top on the upper, upper picture. And then on the lower right is a stir fry. And then thinking about, you know, we eat with our eyes first. So taking that time to make things look pleasant, even when we're eating alone. Um, now that I do consulting work, I, I work from home and I do a lot of work in my house. And even if I'm having my lunch to really sit down, not at my desk, but I'm sitting down and just setting up a plate and for 10 to 15 minutes, it's me and my food. It's waking up those senses around this eating experience where we tend to eat a lot less if we are, if we're focused on our food rather than still on our computer or otherwise. And then the dessert flip, same as we have the protein flip, thinking about instead of having a giant piece of cheesecake with one drizzly strawberry on top, what about having one delicious truffle or a small wedge of cake surrounded by colorful berries? So this idea of when we get to dessert, we're pretty much full. So there's this sense of, I just wanna wrap this meal up with a little ribbon and, and to do that in this manner. Also dark chocolate and fruit. So this is, you know, re-envisioning um, in our household. We love to get different um, types of chocolate. Um, if there's a chocolatier in Idlewild that we really love. We know the family and when we eat their chocolate, they have different origins. So we'll put a different ones out. We'll slow down. We'll, we'll really feel the nuances of the different um, origins from different countries. And we also know who made that food. So we know when we're choosing chocolate that was made locally, I can picture Eric, I can picture Jessica, I can picture Sophia, who's played with my kids many times when we're up there. And, and to know that my choice and my food, it just, it, it roots me. And that's the other part of kind of waking up the senses or having simple in season fruit. I realize right now I look at those peaches and I want them and they're not with us quite yet, but the cherries will come soon enough. But that idea of connecting to our seasons. So by going to the farmer's market or otherwise. And as I get close to my finish here, remembering that playing with your food is allowed and encouraged. It's really just thinking about different ways of spending some time thinking about our plate almost as a, as a canvas uh, to play with. And again, even making a, a food platter on the right, just fresh fruit, having that accessible and easy to grab on the way to work um, as a way to add more from the plant kingdom on a regular basis. And last but not least, as we finish up, I want you to think about where your beginning is. So where's your beginning as a consumer of food? Where's your beginning as someone who lives in community with others or as someone wanting to prevent disease or slow down disease progression? And how can you take this information that you've learned today to create delicious, craveable, uncompromising food that happens to be good for you? And last but not least, you have to eat the rainbow. 
birthday cake style. And today I understand we have a special birthday. So happy birthday <laughs> to Mike Welsh. And with that, I conclude. <laughs> wow, thank you, by the way. And that was a wonderful presentation. And I, I was gonna have a, a meat lover's pizza for my birthday, but I think I'm gonna cancel that. <laughs> Do you want me to go back? Do you need to see your cake again? By the way, yeah, I do want to emphasize there's nothing wrong with having cake, right? I would say have cake as often as you get married. So, <laughs> or every birthday is allowed. Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Well, I have to say that the best news I, I got today was that chocolate is good. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to have chocolate back on, on the allies list. <laughs> yeah, and with that, you want to think about having, uh, when you think about your chocolate, your goal is to get 65% cacao or more. There is actually an incredible amount of antioxidants and fiber. This is when you know I love food. I spend time at the grocery store comparing like a milk chocolate compared to a, a single origin kind of higher percent. And you can even play a game. You can get um, often at the grocery store and it'll tell you the percent and you can figure out kind of where your threshold is of a feeling like it, that's that's too much cacao. I need a little sugar. In there. <laughs> Is that the uh, like the bittersweet uh, morsels? That's where I found my my major source of getting the super high density cacao is from those because they don't sell them as, far as much. Yeah, they often will have um, the 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 semi sweet are usually about sixty five. So so you're gonna, you're you have a good start, Doctor Morris. <laughs> good. Um, I do have a, a, a serious question for you, um, and that is, I noticed that in the Mediterranean diet, they, uh, you had emphasized the olive oil part about it, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about, uh, you know, there's lots of different types of vegetable oils. Is there something about olive oil that has it down on canola oil and, and uh, you know, coconut oil and sunflower seed oil? Is, that, is, is olive oil, my Greek friend tells me yes, but I don't know, he's a little biased. No, that's... Um... First, I have to say the chocolate question is a very important question too. <laughs> so, the, um, so when, um, yes, there are not oil, all oils are created equal. There's essentially when we think of certain oils like avocado oil and olive oil tend to have the best of the, the ratios of anti-inflammatory fat versus pro-inflammatory. The, the other end of that spectrum would be something like corn oil, which is ultra processed and very inflammatory for the body. And the reason this plays a role is most foods that we buy that are processed are, are gonna be made with the pro-inflammatory cheaper oils like the corn oil. So it, for example, dressings that we buy compared to if we start making our own dressing and use olive oil or avocado oil, Again, that's tipping that scale to using things that are much better for your body, short and long term. Hmm. Um, one other uh, question. This is just kind of a, my little pedestrian questions. Is uh, what about meat substitutes? So, uh, I don't know what those are. I'm a little afraid to ask the question because I really like them. But uh, um, uh, is is there a, is there something wrong with those now? <laughs> Oh, I love that you're like, oh, do I really want to fight? Do you want to cover your ears? Maybe the others can hear and you can keep your bliss. So the tricky part with those, I can send you my segment that was on the news a few months, a few years ago now. Uh, the, the tricky part is, yes, it's made from plants, but it is incredibly processed and incredibly high in sodium. So, so there's a balancing act. So it's the same. I'm not going to tell you not to have them, but not to say, sweet, now I can, you know, do my drive through on the way home and have a plant-based burger every day. They, on the caveat, if you do like those, there, there are a lot of non-processed plant-based burgers that are really good. So a lot of use of mushrooms and lentils. So you, there's a way to, to have a plant-based burger that is, that is not nearly as processed as the ones where they make a fake heme. So it bleeds when you bite into it. I mean, it's really from a food science standpoint, it's incredibly interesting. I wouldn't necessarily think your body wants it on a regular basis. Interesting. I have a question that now that's a little bit more specific about lung disease. And that is that um, in, in critical care, um, Oh, I'm sorry. They got a message here that says, oh, um, 
Yeah, in, in fact, I, I want to actually um, get, get a little bit of an opinion about everybody, uh, uh, from everybody about this, but, but um, in critical care, there was all the rage uh, some time ago to try to change um, patients' uh, nutritional amounts and, and proportions. And it was a move away from carbohydrates because of the recognition that when you metabolize carbohydrates, you generate more CO2 um, mm. for every amount of energy than you do if with all the, with the other types of food groups. And I'm wondering if that may be related to uh, some of the effect that, that you might see in COPD or asthma patients is that they're actually, you know, in a high carb diet, they're generating more CO2, which means they have to breathe that CO2 out, you know. So it's interesting. My first question would be is when you say car high carb diet, what kind of carbs are we talking about? Because fruits and vegetables I, are carbohydrates, but they're, um, they're complex carbohydrates versus you know, pizza dough, you know, your typical pizza dough bread, uh, crackers, et cetera, are going to be processed. And the way our body metabolizes those same thing, like a whole grain compared to uh, white flour, white rice is completely different. So that's, so it's tricky when we blanket these kind of high carb diets. So if we think of um, like plant-based eating, most of that is carbohydrates, but it's incredibly complex carbohydrates. Yeah, these are a simple carbohydrate. These are sugars and glucose. And yeah. You know, and those, those a lot of times get lumped in the same. So you have your sugar, you have your processed grains, which are, you know, your white bread. Um, those, those definitely go in the, the, I, I, you're teaching me something with the CO2 in the ICU. Uh, but it's, yeah. So it's the, it's the processed carbohydrates that are really the issue. I have to tell you, I was so enthusiastic and, and uh, uh, enamored with your mention of chocolate before that I forgot my duties here, uh, and that is to introduce the entire members of the panel. And we've already heard from uh, Dr. Welsh. Dr. Welsh, happy birthday again. You can see my, my uh, clown show um, background here. And then we have Dr. Fuster, who is joining us, and Dr. Akathota and Dr. Wong, all here uh, uh, as part of the panel. So. Uh, um, welcome to uh, Dr. Fuster and Dr. Akdodo and Dr. Wong. And uh, do you have any other questions uh, for Dr. Fokia? I had a quick question. Um, I really enjoyed that, Sabrina. That was fantastic um, and really educational. And I, uh, I just had, I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in one of the features to um, the sort of one of the sayings from somebody famous that you said is the middle part to it was eat less. And it's interesting how much you can get away with and it may be part of a Mediterranean diet, I'm not sure, but it's interesting. It just makes me ask a question. If there's something in the Mediterranean diet that is, um, or maybe some key parts that are very healthy, but also incredibly satisfying that make one eat less. In other words, mm. just the sort of big bang, the big bang parts that um, make one eat less. And I, I mean, my parents eat like mice. Um, they're both 92 and quite healthy, knock on wood. And it's pretty... They're from Spain, they're from Barcelona, but they, they just, they eat, you know, they'll split, like leave, they'll split one meal, like the, the American meal is like way too big. And, and of course it has a lot of quote, bad parts, like you're saying, but they, they do eat a lot of, you know, tomato and olive oil and all that kind of stuff. But it's something that maybe is there something that if you're used to the American diet or the, or the, the non-Mediterranean diet and you eat a lot, that there are some secret parts that if you just dose in these few things that are incredibly healthy, and kind of like the secret to eating less, but being satisfied. Is there something there? Or I don't know, maybe we're still studying that. I'm not sure. No, fiber, fiber <laughs> is a lot. If you, yeah, I mean, essentially if you're filling up your stomach. So one of the ways that we feel satisfied is if we're, we're stretching the, the walls of our stomach when we're eating. And when you're eating, um, when you're eating really nutrient dense food, um, versus calorically dense, like your chips are going to be calorically dense. Um, nuts are going to be nutritionally dense. Um, they're, well, they're also calorically dense. That was not a good example, but this, so part of it is there's a lot more fiber when we're eating unprocessed food, which is really satisfying. The other part is usually in areas, and I'm going to guess that your parents eat slower. Um, so that mindfulness yeah. around eating is huge. So we notice that if we slow down our eating and have that mindful aspect, then we're able to know when we're satisfied. And we, we have this goal of wanting to eat. And, and there's this, there's a word in Japan. I can't think of what it is right now of 
of I've had enough, I've had just enough. And often when we eat so fast and um, distracted, when we're eating fast, we tend to go almost not to Thanksgiving stuffed, but we get, we, we get, to, we go too far and we stop having those feedback mechanisms that say I've had enough. And they, actually, I'm just going to add one more thing to that. The other part about eating a lot of food that does not have any nutrients is the way the, the vision I always have is if you say you have a relative that passes away and they have a ton of stuff, they have the attic, they have three floors and you're like, well, I don't have time to go through this. So I'll just have it shipped and I'll put it in my garage and next month I'll go through it. And we don't, right. You know, it just accumulates. And that's often what happens if we're eating a lot of uh, food, our body needs those nutrients. So it's going to absorb all these calories, hoping that there's going to be some treasures in there. And what it does then is store it, it gets converted to fat and then it sits in our body because those nutrients weren't there, but our, it's just, it's too much work to process. And they say, Oh, that was junk. I'll get rid of it. So that that's the other, the other part of that, just to keep in mind. Oh yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question about you. We've used the word antioxidants a lot. <clears throat> we use the term fairly loosely. And, you know, I, I guess I always think of the omega, you know, the omega threes and six and so, and so forth. But are there other examples that are related to what you just presented when you would refer to antioxidant um, that are examples of, uh, of antioxidants or, you know, good ones and bad ones in, in our diet? Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good question. The, um, so when we think of eating the rainbow, besides your cake, the other kind of rainbow, reading eating from different parts of the, the different colors of the rainbow of, of different vegetables and fruits, each one of those is going to give you different vitamins. A lot of those, especially the dark purples are full of antioxidants. So this is where you hear the blueberries, the raspberries, etc. The great thing is, is blueberries have kind of a high price point. And so a lot of people say, well, I can't have that antioxidant. All purple foods have, have some similar properties as far as antioxidants. So purple cabbage, which has a much lower price point is gonna give you some of those antioxidants just like the blueberries do. So that idea of truly variety is a spice of life of eating different colors, but also eating from different parts of the plant. So if you incorporate um, some purple potatoes, that's gonna give you some of those antioxidants, um, beets. And so those are root vegetables, carrots of all different colors. We have purple carrots too. And I'm just focusing on purple because we're talking about these antioxidants specifically. But the goal is not to memorize like, oh, I have bad eyes, so I have to have orange food. It's to remember how we need that variety. And then our body's going to be able to get all the nutrients that it needs. Okay. Good. Sabrina, is there, is there a best time uh, of day to eat? I remember, I remember hearing just when I was a kid about, you know, the breakfast should be the biggest and the lunch is the smallest and you should eat a little, teeny little dinner. I have to say, like most people in the world, I do just the opposite. But is there, is there some, uh, some rhyme or reason to all that? Well, it depends what book I looked at recently. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> That's, yeah. It's really tricky because there's a lot of, um, there really for a long time was this feeling of truly breakfast should be your largest meal and you should taper down as the day goes on and really stop eating several hours before you go to bed. And, and then this intermittent fasting movement came in and I was very reluctant of it at first. Anytime there's kind of this new wave, it's like, all right, what are we looking at here? But the studies have been amazing with, um, I know they've looked at with, with, diabetics and with other numbers of, of having this kind of smaller eating window and deciding what that window of eating really has to do with what works better for you. So like you mentioned, it sounds like uh, Dr. Morris, you don't eat much breakfast. So your eating window might be more from like noon to six or otherwise. Um, but there are some, some really promising studies with intermittent fasting. Um, it was great talk, Sabrina, as always. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the issues for some of my patients is not just food insecurity, but these food deserts, um, there's no place for them to go to buy fresh fruits <laughs> and vegetables or like the quality of the produce in some of the areas, even within San Diego. I mean, it's just, it's just, um, it's just terrible. So that's, that's, you know, that's frustrating because people have to travel so far sometimes just to find good, good quality food. Um, so that's just, just a comment. I think um, a couple specific questions. One, 
um, you know, there's like um, people market agave as a high glycemic replacement for sugar. And I don't know what your thoughts about that. I mean, um, and then the other thing is um, like these nut-based milks. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have any thoughts about, so some of these things are just really expensive, right? So I just worry, especially with people on a limited budget, like, is it worth recommending? Um, like when they ask, like, should I, should I start drinking oat milk or almond mm -hmm. milk? Like so I love, I'm going to start with your comment. Um, so one of the parts of, of culinary medicine that I love and, and uh, Dr. Wang, I know, you know, cause you've been, you've been at my, my uh, second home uh, down in Olivewood Gardens near National City. Um, some people call it food desert, food apartheid is being used um, as a term now too, of how to empower people with weather at, with their budget. So frozen foods are really a great um, cost-effective way to incorporate vegetables. And a lot of the courses I do with the culinary medicine specialist board um, is actually incorporating, we have recipes that are that are written with frozen vegetables with that idea in mind that cost has to be a piece of it. Also encouraging to buy whole grains in bulk and maybe share them like if they're in a community with the church or otherwise to find ways to um, split costs that way. Um, if one does use canned vegetables, those are trickier because they're really filled with sodium. So that's, I always prefer frozen than, um, than canned. So that's, that's the comment on that of really, there are some programs that we're working on through uh, local university where we're getting food delivered to like the little corner stores and the, the hey, yeah. program will actually take away whatever wasn't sold. So the, the store is not out of that produce. So it's creating this kind of mini vegetable stands, which is great. Uh, question on the milk. So my question is like, do you really need white liquid in your life? That's, that's part of it. Right? <laughs> like, and that's, you know, I say that kind of jokingly, but there's a sense that we've, we've just grown up. I mean, the Kellogg family just, just went to town that everyone needs to have this flaky thing with milk in it. And so we've kind of gone from there to now, okay, well, if I can't have, if now I understand that dairy is not the best for me and we're switching over to another white substance and it does tend to be more expensive and it drives me bananas because original almond milk or otherwise they're sweetened as you have to look for the word unsweetened but then you're not getting as much protein as you do with milk it's like what are you gaining for for exactly. it's right. so that's something to keep in mind yeah um and they are and processed they, they have very processed yes. added to them yeah yeah so some people get really excited and they start making their own plant-based milks um you know at home, so that's an option, but that's really the take home is do you really, how much white liquid do you actually need in your life? Okay. So, and then as far as the agave, I'm glad you asked that question because all essentially, even if you have something that's less processed, so agave, maple syrup, honey, those are less processed sweeteners, mm -hmm. yes. Yet the way they interact with our body, that rise in the sugar is the same. So that's another thing. I'm not falling for that health halo. The goal right. is really to have your palate adjust to not needing that sickly sweet flavor. So getting to the point where those yummy berries are really um, right. kind of delicious. And then if you're making a cake or you're making cookies, just make the cookies and enjoy them, right? Yeah. Instead of like, let yeah. me try to make these healthier like just enjoy them and having once in a while. And that's part of it is the goal of really all that I talked about of going for about 80% of your eating to be kind of that plate and the rest is living and it's life. Right. right. Yeah. I think sometimes, you know, people get, I mean, get so overwhelmed because they're already trying to deal with their illness and things like that. So sometimes I know one thing I've just started doing is just saying apple a day. It'll keep mm -hmm. me away. I mean, It'll keep me something, away. keep me something really concrete and small, right? Because it's not, mm -hmm. I feel like these little small things can make a difference. Oh, I can do this. I can have an apple a day. And that's not so hard just as a start. Mm -hmm. but, um, and the other part too is asking what vegetables do you like or what, yeah. what have you bought before? So yeah. Or what food do you yeah. like? I even go back to that because by be asking, what are your right. favorite meals? What are the favorite meals you had at home as a kid or you love yeah. going out to? You can yeah. get a sense of what their palate is yeah. and, and work from yeah. that towards what their next goal would be. But I love that you're thinking about what is the first step that you can do because otherwise it can feel overwhelming. And a, a big question that often comes up is, 
I don't have money to buy organic vegetables. I could never be healthy. So I'm just going to go through the drive through and, and pulling back and saying any yeah. vegetable or fruit added mm-hmm. is already benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, and you brought up organic, so I'm going to make you give us <laughs> your give us your uh, your feelings about that category and how important that is. And the other question I had was a few years ago we were there was people creating super food, super food lists, and we really thought that was real, really the answer. So what happened to that list, and is that pretty much the same kind of food that you've been talking about in your talk today? Uh, so to go with your first question, now I'm starting to forget what it was. Organic. Organic. Yeah. So, so when we look at organic, so if somebody um, chooses to go down the organic route, there's actually these great lists and you can just Google them called the dirty dozen and the clean 15. And essentially those terms come from when you grow certain foods, there's certain ones like strawberries, for example, that really absorb a lot of the pesticides much more than other fruits would. So if you're going to decide to get a few things that are organic, that list helps you to prioritize which ones would be better to prioritize organic or not. And then as far as the superfoods, we are in a society of the one hit wonder, right? Like we always want the magic pill, the magic food. Um, And we are, we now have access to things like pitaya and um, the really purple one that I can't, acai, acai bowls, et cetera. And it's exactly like you said, Dr. Welsh, it's the same, the same concept as I was talking about. So yes, um, acai is super purple. It's going to have a lot of antioxidants. It also has an incredibly high price point. So having some frozen blueberries or putting, um, you know, purple cabbage on my, on my fish tacos, which again, corn tortilla is going to be a whole grain. You got your fish, which fits a Mediterranean, you got your cabbage, uh, salsas. I'm happy to help you make them. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so again, it's not saying you have to eat cardboard to be healthy. It's really finding ways to make it delicious and varied. Well, Dr. Fauke, you did it to us again, uh, <laughs> as, as you did last year, that the hour just went right by and, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your fabulous presentation. It was really entertaining and, and it will be available uh, for uh, YouTube viewing uh, in the future. So uh, we were, are going to definitely keep you, uh, I guess we don't have Rolodexes anymore, but we'll keep you on the list and, and we'd love to have you back again sometime. Thank you so much. This was absolutely fantastic. And I want to thank each and every one of you because I have felt your support through this career transition. And I truly, truly thank you. It's our privilege. Thanks. And uh, we'll join us next week uh, when we will have uh, Dr. Laura Crotty Alexander is going to talk with us a little bit about the opposite thing, about bad things, about uh, smoking and vaping and flavored tobacco. So until that time, uh, have a great week, everybody. And thank you again, Sabrina. Thank My pleasure. You. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so Happy much. Happy birthday. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs>